right. <laughs> Go. <laughs> and I'll start. <laughs> Uh, hello, welcome back to Lasagne. Next speaker is Nicolas Tolovey, which is going to speak about genetic algorithms and music. Right, thank you very much. <laughs> I I'd say for your applause, you've not heard what I'm going to play to you in a minute. It might be really rubbish. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to do is present to you a fun brain break project that I've been working on. It has absolutely no practical use whatsoever. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is that uh, it combines three things that, that I love, uh, which is music, programming, and learning about new things, uh, basically. Um, so the way it's going to work is uh, I'm assuming, uh, the only thing I'm assuming is that you know Python. So if you don't know any music theory, don't worry. Um, I'm going to explain that at the beginning give you just enough information so that you understand the problem that I'm trying to solve and the, the, some of the subtleties of it. Then I'm going to move on to uh, discussing genetic algorithms and how I use those to solve this musical problem. And then at the end, I'm going to play you some music, some computer-generated music, and I'm going to play you some human-generated music, and I'm going to ask you to see if you can tell me which one's which. A bit of a fun Turing test game. Um, the other thing that I'd like to do, uh, I want to find out a little bit about your... Um, I was going to say capabilities, but it makes you sound like a server or something. Um, so uh, could you put your hand up if you're tone deaf and have difficulty telling the difference between a lawnmower and a saxophone? Okay, so if you classify yourself as somebody who's had no musical training whatsoever, but you listen to music and you enjoy it, and it's, it's a nice thing to do. Okay, cool, some hands. Okay, so could you put your hand up if you've had some musical training? Maybe you had piano lessons when you were a kid, but you've not done anything since then. Wow, some more. Fantastic. Great. Okay, um, and put your hand up if you're currently engaged in some sort of musical activity, uh, maybe as a good amateur, um, or maybe you got up to grade eight and you're still playing at that level. Okay, so there's a few hands. Bad amateurs, good, as long as you're a current musician. So I know that your knowledge is sort of up to date. And uh, put your hands up if you've ever played professionally or you've got a music degree from a conservatoire like the Royal College of Music or something like that. So that's two people. Fantastic. So you'll be able to spot my mistakes. There we go. Okay, so let's start. So I've written two pieces of music, two melodies, two contrasting tunes. I'm going to play them to you. Here's the first one. Here's the second. Now the important thing here is that I use the word contrasting. So uh, what do I mean by contrasting melodies? What are the terms of reference that, um, that I'm using to say that these two melodies are different? So let's unpack that a little bit and have a look. So one way um, that we can say that these are contrasting is by looking at the melodic shape, um, the shape of the melody. So uh, in case you don't read music, uh, the, uh, the uh, horizontal axis is time, basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the vertical one is pitch. That's how high or low the notes sound. So high, low, like that, OK? So I've, uh, in my gimpish sort of a way, scrawled a line over the notes, over the pitches, so you can, sh so you can see the contour of the melody. And um, it, it's actually easier if I remove the notes. So uh, the top melody is quite jagged. It, it leaps around quite suddenly. And uh, although it's quite, probably quite hard, well, it's hard for me from this uh, position um, to see this, but it starts low and it ends high. Okay? If you contrast that in terms of contour with the second melody, um, it just sits there, um, kind of flat. Oh, God. Um, there's a hump, and then it's flat again. And it doesn't really move anywhere. It's still in the same place in terms of pitch um, at the end. So one way you might think about this visually is that it's just contours. It's the contrast between the French Alps and uh, the Long Mind, the rolling hills of the Long Mind in Shropshire, near where I come from. Okay, another way that these melodies are 
contrasting is the number of notes that's in them. Okay, so once again, in my gimpish sort of a way, I just went splat, 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 splat with the paintbrush over the notes so that you could see, um, see this. Uh, if I take the, uh, the score away, it makes it a lot more obvious. Uh, the top melody has a lot more notes in it, a lot more going on. Um, the density is, is greater. Uh, so, dense versus sparse. Another visual sort of uh, way hook to remember this, okay? This is important because when I ask you to listen to computer-generated music versus the uh, human music, I want you to be able to hear, try and concentrate on these sorts of things. So, what happens if I put these two contrasting melodies together? They're quite different. What will happen, I wonder? some mysterious sort of a way. So what I'm going to do is try and do a little bit of a listening exercise to get your ears warmed up, okay? So I'm going to play uh, these two melodies again. Um, what I want you to do is to choose one of the two melodies, okay, and try and follow it, just the contour of the melody as I'm playing it this time. But here's the trick. I don't want you to concentrate fully on the melody that you choose. I want you to try and... Uh, I don't know, use 20% of your attention on the whole piece of music as well. I want you to also try and be aware of the contour, the shape of the other melody, whichever other one it is that you've chosen. So, have a listen. Think about the one that you're following, but also try and pay attention to the other. And think about the contour. How many people got to the end at the same time as when they were following the, the music? Okay. Hmm. <laughs> I was hoping for more hands than that. Okay. So, that's, what I want you to do now is uh, listen again, but this time swap the melodies, choose the other melody, and I want you to think about the density of the music. So while you're following it, try and also be aware of what the other melody is doing as well. So concentrated. <laughs> okay, so counterpoint, another visual cue, like this Isha drawing. They're two very different things, but somehow they're mysteriously related. Okay, that's the kind of crux of this talk. So the other thing that uh, I want to explain is that uh, counterpoint isn't just about putting two melodies on top of each other. There are lots of interesting things that you can do to those melodies. Um, so uh, the past master at doing this sort of thing was Johann Sebastian Bach, so I've used Johann um, as a visual demonstration of some of these transformations. So if we had an original melody, which is represented by, by the old chap over there on, the, on your left, um, one way I could transform a melody is make an inversion of it. Okay? Turn it upside down. So where the original went up three steps, the inversion would go down three steps, and so on like that. Okay? Another way that I could transform the melody is by making it retrograde, which means I play it backwards. So instead of reading it from left to right, I'm reading it from right to left. And of course, you could combine transformations for a power-up or something like that, and you get a retrograde inversion, which is both applied at the same time. Other ways that you can play around in counterpoint is with the voicing. So if we heard a melody at the beginning of the piece of music that was played high up in the register, okay, it was in the treble, um, later on, we might hear it in the bass. Okay, so something that was originally high up is now low down, like Bach's head. Um, whilst all those transformations have been to do with pitch, how high or low the note is, uh, the next two uh, transformations are to do with time. So augmentation is when literally you pull the, the melody apart. Um, so you might double the length of the notes um, in the melody. And diminution is exactly the same, but in the opposite direction, you're sort of squashing, uh, thinning the, the melody. Okay, um, and what I've done is I've taken the original two melodies that I played together and I've made two transformations to them starting around here. And I'm going to play it to you and then I'm going to ask you if you can 
identify what those two uh, transformations were. Don't worry if you don't want to use the uh, technical terminology, you know, just say, oh, it was backwards or upside down or something like that. Okay, so here's the melody, here's the counterpoint. idea? Just put your hand up. Yep. Retrograde. It was retrograde. It was played backwards. Yeah. And what else have I messed around with here? Yep. No, I've not turned it um, upside down. Voicing. So the uh, top part is now at the bottom and it's being played backwards and the bottom part is now at the top and it's being played backwards. Okay. Cool. Well done, you guys. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that Composers, not only do they know this mysterious relationship between two different melodies, but um, they'll start to do interesting things with just one melody. It'll have some sort of magic internal logic so that you'll hear that if you actually play it as a retrograde inversion um, at an augmentation to itself, it's its own bass line sort of thing. That makes sense. You can transform the melody and do interesting things and layer it on top of itself in all sorts of clever ways. Okay, So... How the hell do composers know that it'll work? You know, you're writing these notes, and how do you know that these two melodies are going to fit together? And when I was a teenager, when I was learning music, this really um, bugged me. I really, really wanted to know what the answer was. I was passionate about classical music, as it happened, and I wanted to be able to like, write counterpoint like Bach. That's the nerdy sort of a teenager I was. <laughs> um, so, how does it work? If only... There was a writing counterpoint for Dummy's book, <laughs> where in 24 hours I would learn the secret art of counterpoint writing. <laughs> Actually, uh, there is, um, although it would take more than 24 hours to complete. Uh, this is a work that was written 300 years ago called Gradus Ad Parnassum. I'll try and read it. Sive uh, Manoductio Ad Compositionem Musicae Regularum. Methodo nova ac certa nondum ante, tam exacto ordine in lucum edita elaborata a Johann Josefo Fuchs, which basically says, this tells you how to write counterpoint in Latin. Um, <laughs> Gradus ad Parnassum, steps to the, uh, to the house of God. And here he is, Johann Josef Fuchs. What a hairdo. So, um, He's quite a remarkable guy, actually. At a time when uh, your parents, who your parents were, dictated uh, what you did in society, uh, he was very much the exception to the rule. We don't know anything about his early life, quite simply because he was born of peasants, the very lowest in society. Um, and either because he was incredibly charismatic and also um, uh, very talented, he ended up being uh, the court composer for three holy Roman emperors, uh, which is like the top music job in Europe. Really. So this guy, you know, his was the sort of uh, dream, sort of, uh, he was really living the dream, as it were, in uh, 300 years ago. But because of his talent and his connections and because he had to teach aristocrats music as well as his other students, he wanted to kind of codify uh, the rules of counterpoint. And so he wrote Grados Ad Parnassum as a, as a handbook for it. So the steps to Parnassus. So if you follow the steps I tell you in this book, you too can arrive in Parnassus, the dwelling place of the gods, and you will produce godlike counterpoint, like, like I do, said Fuchs. So, here's how it works. There are five species of counterpoint. Um, each species contains a, rule, a set of rules. First species counterpoint contains uh, very simple rules and only a few rules, but it means that you write very constrained counterpoint. Okay. Second species relaxes the rules a bit, adds a few more for edge cases and so on and so forth. Um, and, so, uh, and what you do is uh, you learn each species until you get to fifth species, which allows you to write counterpoint that sounds similar to the stuff that I was playing you that I'd written at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the talk. And the rules, what are the rules concerned with? 
They're concerned with pitch, which is how high or low a note is, and how different pitches in different melodies relate to each other. And they also concern themselves with how pitch moves through time. Okay? How you might have this note here, and then this note after it, followed by this note. Okay? So it gives you the valid sort of ordering of pitch that you could use in different melodies. And this is how it works. Um, he starts with two-part counterpoint, which is what I've been playing to you. Two parts because it's got two melodies. Okay? And you, um, you learn the rules for first species counterpoint in two parts, for example. And then your teacher would give you a cantus firmus, which is a melody, basically. I'll come on to what a cantus firmus is in a minute. And then you are told, given this cantus firmus, Using the rules of first species counterpoint, I want you to write a melody to go with it, another tune, okay, that will fit. Um, and then once you've managed to prove that you've got first species counterpoint in two parts solved, you sort of level up and achievement unlocked, and you do second species counterpoint with two parts, and you go on and so forth until you do fifth species with two parts, and then you go back all the way to first species again, because... You know, that's just the sort of game he plays on you. And you do it with three parts and so on and so forth. First species in three parts. Uh, second species in three parts and so on. Okay? That's basically how it works. So, the cantus firmus. The cantus firmus is very simple. Quite simply because it makes it easy for people to uh, work out uh, what they want to set above it. So, I'm going to play you a cantus firmus. And it's basically based on medieval plain chant. So it's a medieval hymn. Afraid not. That's not going to win Eurovision anytime soon, but the point is, is that it's simple, so it makes it easy for the student to think about the rules that they need to apply in their melody, the, the second melody that goes with that cantus firmus. Um, there we go. So, the rules concerning pitch. Um, some of the most important rules talk about the differences between the pitches in the melodies, okay? And the difference between pitches is called the interval, okay? This isn't going to get too technical, don't worry. But basically, it's the grey bit in the middle, how far apart the two melodies are and how they move in relation to each other like that. Okay? And intervals um, are categorised in two ways. They are categorised into dissonances, which sound nasty, and consonances, which sound nice. Okay? And the rules will say you can use a consonant um, at a fifth or an octave on the first note of a first species counterpoint. Okay? Uh, that's the sort of rule that he's, he's, he's using. Um, I'm going to play you some intervals so you can hear what I mean. Okay? So the, uh, the intervals that are dissonances have an asterisk next to them. So that's the second, the fourth, and the seventh. And hopefully you'll be able to hear some are nasty, some are nice. Here we go. So unison is both playing the same note. about interval, which you can use in what particular context, depending on what the melody's doing. Okay? The other sort of uh, rules um, are to do with movement through time. It sounds like I'm sort of giving a talk to Time Lords or Doctor Who or something, but um, what he does, he describes uh, four different ways that notes can move through time. Um, there's similar motion, which I've marked in green. So the first three bars are all in similar motion. That means that the notes are going in the same direction, but by a different degree. So the top notes are moving by step, but the bottom notes, the E, the G, and the C, are moving by step. Okay? That's similar motion. Parallel motion is when they're moving in the same way, okay? but they're moving by the same degree. They're all moving by one step. Okay? Then um, the next notes are similar notion, motion, 
Um, these notes here, from here to here, are contrary motion. So they're moving um, in the opposite direction to each other, contrary to each other. And oblique motion at the end is when one part is moving at a different speed to the other. Okay? Let me play this to you so you'll, you'll soon get the idea. Similar motion. Parallel motion. Similar again. Contrary. And oblique. So, the question I asked myself, rather foolishly, was how can I use Fuchs's species counterpoint, uh, species, <laughs> Fuchs's rules for species counterpoint to create computer-generated music? Um, so, here's the problem. Um, unfortunately, given all the possible combinations of notes, um, it's just a huge number of potential um, results, okay? Um, it's more like a, a needle in a haystack problem, okay? And um, some people have tried this problem before, and they've tried to create the solutions algorithmically, okay, by going, well, we're here, let's look at what the rules tell us to do next, let's go here, okay, now we're here, let's see what we're going to do next, and so on and so forth, and they sound, to my ears anyway, robotic, okay, as if they've been created by a computer, and I didn't want that, I wanted it to sound a bit more um, natural. Okay, so what I wanted to create was a solution that was timely, okay, so it would produce a result in about the same amount of time as a human would, um, and it needed to be acceptable, which is where you come in, uh, where it would fool most of the people most of the time, which I'm going to find out at the end of this talk, whether I can fool most of the people most of the time with the result. Okay, in other words, I want this thing to be on par with a human-derived solution. So, genetic algorithm. Um, how many people are familiar with genetic algorithms? Okay, that's quite a lot if you're good. Um, I'm no expert in genetic algorithms. Part of the point of what I was doing was so I could find out about these things and, and play around with them. Okay? So as I'm sure you'll all know, uh, genetic algorithms find solutions in huge potential universes of, of solutions um, relatively quickly. They find acceptable solutions. Perhaps not the best solution, but acceptable ones. Um, and they start with an initial population of randomly generated solutions, okay? And then what happens is that they apply evolutionary processes like mutation and breeding um, to the solutions in each generation to create a new generation. And then they check to see, well, have we got an acceptable solution in that? No, we haven't. Okay, let's reapply the process again and again and again until a good solution has been found, has evolved within the population, okay? And, of course, they're damn interesting, which is why I was interested in them and wanted to have a play with them, okay? Hey, presto, Fuchs, get it, is born. This is my little tool, okay? So, how does it work? Um, so, this is the obligatory how to do a genetic algorithm uh, diagram. When I looked on Google Images for a genetic algorithm image, they all looked kind of like this, but they're all different. So, this is kind of my take on it. You start with initial population. Uh, I check the fitness. And then using the fitness score, uh, I, use, I, I do some breeding. Uh, this is the sex driven rock and roll part of the talk. Um, and the breeding is done in such a way that the fittest uh, are more likely to be chosen for the breeding to take place. Uh, then I apply mutation, so I'm randomly sort of flipping things around in the chromosome. Uh, so I'm changing them again. Um, and then pass back the new generation. Uh, have I found an acceptable solution? If I haven't, I go all the way back. If I have, thank you very much. Tell me what the fittest solution is because it's an acceptable solution and I can use that as the result, okay? So, uh, this is it in, uh, in Python. It's a generator function uh, that, yield, that just keeps yielding new um, populations, okay? Um, there's not really much to say about it apart from uh, it takes four arguments. Uh, the population, the initial randomly generated population, it takes a fitness function which is used to work out how fit each of the uh, potential solutions are in any generation. Um, then it uses the generate function, which encapsulates the breeding and the mutation to create a new, um, a new population. And then the halt function is called to check if we found an acceptable solution. It's, it's not rocket science, this. So originally, I was going to give you some sort of genetic algorithm talk with, uh, with music as the example that I wanted to evolve. But, uh, I kind of figured that most of you aren't musicians, it would kind of lose you or something. So I've chosen a really, really simple example um, problem uh, to demonstrate how I've implemented my genetic algorithm. 
So what I did is I created another tool called Word Elution, which is really, really useful because it evolves words. So I can tell it, uh, as you can see up there, Word Elution with the minus W flag cat. I want it to evolve the word cat. Okay, so this is truncated here, but if you look at the top population, the list of three-letter words, it's just random generated, randomly generated junk. But it's found one, pot, which has a fitness function, which has a fitness score of one. Okay? And the second generation has perhaps some more fitter solutions that are closer to the word cat, and so on and so forth, until finally, down here, we've evolved the word cat out of uh, each iteration of the, uh, gener of the genetic algorithm. Okay? So, um, how do I judge the fitness of these words? Well, it's quite easy. I use the Levenstein distance, okay, or a variation thereof, okay? So um, that's what I'm checking in the fitness function, um, and I'm using a closure here because I want to check it against the, uh, the target word, cat, in our case, okay? Um, every candidate solution is an instance of uh, this genome base class. Um, this is where I try to use the correct terminology, but I can never remember what it all means, so you'll just have to forgive me if I get it wrong. But there are two important attributes in the genome class. That's chromosome and fitness. Chromosome is a list of values that describe what the solution is. And in the case of the word elution thing, it's the characters C, A, T, or A, B, C, or whatever it is. Okay? So I could build the word from the chromosome. And of course, there's the fitness score, which is provided by the fitness function when it checks it. Okay? Um, there are two methods. Breed, which uses something called a crossover function, which I'll describe in a second, and mutate, which is overridden in a base class. Okay? So this class is actually used by, um, by Fuchs as well. So this is, the, this is where reproduction happens. <laughs> this is the sexy slide. Uh, I use... <laughs> I use crossover... Um, and basically what I do is I take the chromosome of a mummy and a daddy and I choose a crossover point at some point in the chromosome and then I just swap the ends, basically, so that the two children that are, that are returned, the baby one and baby two, are a combination of the information in the cr chromosome of the mummy and the daddy. Okay, you can see that happening here. Okay, so cat and dog could produce cog and dat. Does that make sense? Okay, because I've obviously split between the first and the second character and then swapped the ends around. Okay? And in, in the word elution command, uh, I've, I've subclassed the genome class uh, with mutate, uh, with the mutate function. Um, basically, what I'm doing is going over the, iterating over the chromosome and there's a, a mutation rate chance that I might randomly change the value at that point in, in the chromosome list, okay? So where there might be a DOG, uh, if, uh, if I have the mutation rate right, uh, it might, by chance, change it to DUG, because I've changed the O to a U. It's just a randomly selected letter, okay? And this allows the genetic algorithm to search new areas of the, uh, of the problem space uh, and evolve new solutions. Okay, so the, the generate function makes new generations. Um, when I showed this talk to a friend of mine who's um, a university professor and expert in genetic algorithms, he said, well, it's not very common for people to save the top 50% the, the top of a generation. So the first thing I do is, given a generation, um, the, the original generation, um, what I do is I take uh, the fittest 50%. Um, okay, that means that um, there's no way that I can kind of slide backwards evolutionary, uh, in evolutionary terms, okay, because there's always going to be the fittest uh, solution in the next generation. Um, but he said 50%, that's a bit arbitrary, and I said, yes, well, you know, it just means I have to do length divided by two, which makes it kind of easy really to go. Um, and the rest of the next generation um, are created here, where what I do is I select a mummy and a daddy with something called a roulette wheel selection, which I'll talk about in a minute, but that basically means that the fitter you are, the more likely you are to be selected, okay? And then um, I create some children by breeding the mummy with the daddy. Um, and then I add those to the, uh, to the new generation. And then you can see down at the bottom, there's the, the mutate function happening on all the offspring. Um, and then I do some jiggery pokery to make sure that the new... Um, 
new generation is the right length, and then I would just return the new generation, nice and easy. Um, so roulette wheel selection, what's that all about? That's the function, um, but actually it's a lot better if I just show you a picture of a sort of a roulette wheel. So what I'm doing is totaling up all the fitness scores, okay? So that means if you look at the top, V, X, C, O, Y, W, and M, S, S, that all have a fitness score of zero, don't even get on to the roulette wheel to be potentially selected, okay? And the, the amount of space that you get on the roulette wheel is a proportion of your fitness within the total fitness score, okay? So in this case, I've got a three in five chance of choosing something that's really quite fit, okay? Finally, I have a halt function which tells me, um, basically, is the fitness score the same length as the target word, in which case I've got all the letters right, so I can halt. Uh, I also make sure that I don't go any more than 100 generations, just so that um, it's not going on forever and ever. Okay, so, now, going back to Fuchs, the two biggest differences between the word illusion example and Fuchs is the encoding of, uh, of the musical information, which is the chromosome. So the chromosome in each of the genome classes uh, is a list of numbers, basically, which is good because when I'm testing um, for the rules of species counterpoint, if I want to find what the interval is, I just take away the, the, the base value from the treble value and what's left gives me the, the interval that I need. Okay, so I can, um, I can encode the cantospermus down here using the numbers 5, 7, 6, 5, 8, 7, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, as described at the top there. The other major difference is obviously the fitness functions aren't, you know, how close are you in Levenstein distance to a word. It's more like this, the encoding of the heuristics that, uh, that Fuchs gives in his Gratis Ad Parnassum. Okay? So these are two examples. The first example is to make sure in first species counterpoint that the note starts at an interval of a fifth or an interval of an octave. Okay? And I use rewards and punishment scores to, um, to change the fitness. Uh, and the last uh, and the second uh, example um, makes sure that the last note in a first species counterpoint is right in that it finishes at an octave. Okay? And again, I'm using rewards and punishments to change the value of the fitness function. Okay? And here's all the rewards and punishments that I'm using for first species counterpoint. Uh, and basically, when I do a test, I start with zero. And if you tick a few boxes, you get... Um, the score incremented. If you make a few mistakes, put a foot wrong, they get decremented by these amounts. Um, and the values for each of these particular punishments and rewards, they're kind of hand-tuned. So these are a bit like kind of the knobs that I can twiddle to make sure that the counterpoint comes out right. Okay? So the question... Okay, sorry, I missed this slide. A simple command. Okay, so all I need to do now is run the Fuchs command uh, the minus S flag tells me which species I want, so I want first species counterpoint. Minus CF for the Cantus firmus. That's a numeric encoding of the Cantus firmus uh, using the, the scheme I just showed you a couple of slides ago. Uh, dot uh, uh, minus O for output is the name of the file that I want. So kind of evolution happens at that point. Fuchs kicks in. And what it produces is a LilyPond file. GNU LilyPond is a music type setting program, part of the GNU project. And what it will do, it produces beautiful looking music. It's, it's the thing that I used for all the musical examples uh, in here. And it also produces um, a MIDI file, so you can hear the piece of music. So I use LilyPond to uh, take the output from Fuchs and turn it into a PDF and a MIDI, and then I can go and listen to it and cry because it didn't work or whatever. <laughs> so here's the question. I've been trying to get to this point in my talk because I want to see whether I, might, I can fool you. Uh, so how does it perform? Species counterpoint was composed 300 years ago, and Fuchs actually provided solutions. Okay? So, what I'm going to do is play you uh, first, second, third, and fourth species counterpoint, and you're going to hear two melodies, uh, two solutions, and I want you to tell me which one is Fuchs and which one is Python. Um, <laughs> and um, Actually, we have the notebooks for Mozart, Brahms, Bruckner, and Beethoven, as well as many other composers, uh, and their solutions to, to these. So I've actually used Mozart for the second species counterpoint. Can I get you to misidentify Mozart? So, counterpoint, my turn. <laughs> there we are. Fuchs versus Python. Here we go. Here's the first one. Now remember, 
the cancer sperm as the bottom line is what's been given to the genetic algorithm or the student. And Fuchs or Python has provided the top line. Okay? Very, very simple at this stage. It's first species counterpoint. Here's the second melody. Okay, crunch time. So if you thought that the first solution, the top one, was created by Python. Could you put your hand up now? Hey, that's about half of you. And if you think... <laughs> <laughs> if you think the bottom one was created by Python, could you put your hand up? Okay, surprisingly enough, that's half of you. Okay, the top one was Fuchs. Bottom one was Python. Second species counterpoint. <laughs> Mozart versus Python. Here we go. First solution. Okay, so there's more oblique motion in the second species counterpoint, and there are dissonances now allowed quite a number of rules about dissonances. Okay, so, um, here we go. Which of you thought the top line was Mozart? human derived. Is the top line Mozart? Don't be frightened. There's a lot of you going like this waiting to see who puts... Okay. So I'd say that's about, I don't know, a quarter or a third of you think that the top line is Mozart. Okay. And the bottom line, is that Mozart? Put your hand up now if you think that's Mozart. Okay. More of you. You'll be pleased to know that you're right. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> third species counterpoint. A bit more complicated. Okay, Python versus Fuchs again. Okay, even more complicated in terms of oblique motion. Um, a lot more rules about how the contour of the melody is allowed to move, and obviously there are more dissonances allowed in there as well. So um, here we go. Here's the first solution. Second solution. Okay, hands up if you think the top line was Python. Okay, that's about half, actually. And hands up if you think the bottom line was Python. Surprisingly, about half of you. Okay, here's the crunch time. The top one was Python. <laughs> okay, this is more exciting than Eurovision, isn't it? Then? <laughs> okay, fourth species counterpoint. Again, some Fuchs versus Python. Up. Uh, the thing about a four species counterpoint, it may seem like a step backwards, but it's introducing something called a suspension, which I won't go into. But a suspension is when you're allowed to put a dissonance on the first beat of a bar, and it re will resolve to a consonant. Um, which is why, instead of putting it note for note, it's going bom, dom, 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 like that, alternately. Okay, so here's the first solution.
second solution. Okay, so we'll try. Which one's Python? If you think the top one is Python, could you put your hand up now? Okay, that's not many of you. If you think the bottom one is Python, could you put your hand up now? Most of you think the bottom one is Python. That's really interesting because... <laughs> if you look at the notes, there's quite a lot of similarity between them, which I found really quite, quite cool. Okay, fifth species, I'm finished. Fifth species. <laughs> okay, you know how they said uh, about Pi Pi? Well, we've done 90% of it, and now we've got to do the other 90%. Well, this is, this is the same. Fifth species is a completely different level in terms of complexity of the rule. It's basically everything that's gone before, um, and then some. Um, so I've not started to work on it with Python. I did do some of this stuff when I was at university, and I produced a load of rubbish. Um, it's kind of 10 years down the line now. I think I know more about programming and have a better feel for the problem. So I, I don't, I've, I've not created uh, a fitness function for fifth species counterpoint. But I'm going to play you Fuchs's answer to fifth species counterpoint so you can hear how similar it is to the counterpoint I played to you at the beginning. Next steps, for me, obviously I want to attempt fifth species counterpoint. Um, I want to improve the current offering. Um, every time I was playing those pieces, I was looking at this guy here uh, who put his hand up when I said, uh, if you've been to a music conservatory or you have a music degree or something like that, we'll see whether he would spot the obvious mistakes because there are, if you've been trained as a musician, it's, it's pretty obvious which one's wrong and which one's right. There are some uh, really quite appallingly bad mistakes. So I can... Um, I can obviously tweak the fitness function, okay? Um, and another thing I want to do is explore other ways in which I can combine programming and music. Uh, you may not appreciate that. <laughs> okay, the source code for all this, including the slides, is, uh, is on GitHub, uh, blah, 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 the usual stuff about GitHub. Um, uh, okay, and then any questions? That's it. All right, that was great. Okay, first question. <laughs> there you go. Hi, um, actually, I missed all this uh, oh. great questions, so I just thinking that Python plays b better than Mozart. <laughs> 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 but uh, I am a com uh, I am a natural language processing uh, re researcher, and um, did you think about uh, from the other side because? Um, I'm also fa familiar with uh, um, genetic algorithms, yeah. but you could do actually most of this work uh, in the same uh, in the other way that you can use uh, n-grams and uh, something like that, yeah. just Markov to chains. yeah, yeah. Markov chains, ju just to learn from uh, plenty of examples of, of playing, and then you 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 are not. Uh, you don't need to implement all these rules by yeah. as a fitness function, but you just you can learn a, a, a arbitrary this uh, kind of things. Do you think about it, or do you want to do this or in later research? What do you yeah. think about it? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, if you missed the beginning of the talk, part of the point of this was so I could learn a bit about genetic algorithms. Okay, um, and you're right; it's probably not the best way to go about um, solving these problems. Uh, the strategy that you um, talk about using n-grams and Markov chains. Uh, has been used before with other musical systems. So um, uh, Douglas Hofstadter um, 
in a book whose name I can't remember, talks about exactly doing this. And depending on how, how big the value of n is, will get you closer to something that sounds like the target composer, as it were. Um, so it's something that I want to look at. Um, and, yeah, I have been thinking about that a lot, actually. Um, it's something that I, I want to look into. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. First of all, congratulations because it was the longest ovation I have heard on this and previous EuroPython. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Very, very, very nice. Uh, my question is, uh, how long did it take you to, to do this and uh, how would you split this time between understanding the rules and, and real calling, real solving this, this the problem? Okay. So, um, I did a lot of the, the thinking around this when I was at university because I attempted this very problem and didn't get very far, which was basically my master's thesis, which is how I cocked it all up, really. Um, you could see how long it took me from the GitHub check-ins. Uh, but basically, it was about a month to write, to write this. Um, and uh, the third part of the question was... Uh, Understanding the, the, the rules. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, once I'd got, the, the, once I'd got the, uh, the way the genetic algorithm worked, um, I tested it with first species counterpoint. And that took quite a while to understand how, you know, the subtleties of how a genetic algorithm would work and how I might apply the musical uh, rules to it. Uh, but once I got that figured out, I used that as a template for the second species and third species and fourth species. Unfortunately, fifth species is so kind of out there and complicated that I can't use that template. So I'm going to have to start again and think carefully about fifth species. But yeah, that's basically how I did it. So the way that you do your breeding, you take, you set a midpoint, you take. Uh, chromosomes to the left. It, it could be any point. Yeah. Along. yeah, but you don't just you don't just say for each chromosome pick from a random parent. You you try to get kind of contiguous sections. Yeah. Right? So, Is that so, common to all genetic algorithms, oh, or did you pick that because it would help you here? Um, there are two reasons why I did it that way. The first one was simplicity, because it's it's simple to explain, it's simple to understand. And I'm learning about genetic algorithms. And there are lots of different ways that you could combine, you can breed um, different chromosomes um, that, that I looked at. Uh, uh, the, other, the other one was that um, it, it just fit with having a contiguous set of notes that, that formed the melody. Um, so you could put the beginning of one melody with the end of the other melody, and you know, it would still produce a valid uh, melody. Uh, so it kind of worked in that sense. Uh. This one over there. Okay. Um, what was the average running time of your your simulations, and, and okay. do so, you have um, any consistent number of how many generations you needed to pass the fitness function? Okay, so uh, for first species counterpoint, it's a matter of seconds. Um, for Third species counterpoint, which is a, a lot more complicated, um, I'd say 30 seconds to a minute, depending on how it's moving around the fitness, in, uh, around the solution um, space. Um, I've not really done that much because I only finished this sort of stuff two weeks ago. Um, so I've not done that much analysis of, of, of what I've got, um, which is why I said I, I wanted to think carefully about this and, and measure stuff and, and then try and improve it. Um, fifth species counterpoint, That'll be just off the chart. Um, I have no idea how long that's going to take. But um, it definitely meets the requirement that I set myself at the beginning that it has to be done in a timely fashion. Which, how many generations is this? That depends on the species. So each species has a, has a different number of candidate solutions in a generation. So third species counterpoint has something like uh, 1,500, I think it is. Um, uh, and it won't run more than 200 generations. Okay, so often what will happen is that we will find, find a really fit solution around generation 120, and it will just stay at that particular solution. It's kind of honed in on that. Um, so one way I could improve that is, is, is that if it's found a solution and it's just never going to evolve because everything else is now that solution in, in, in the population just to stop because um, it's honed in. Another alternative is that I could, once honed in, do something really crazy. Um, to try and kick it out of that local, um, but yeah, that's it. Yeah, you, well, you know what this is about. Yeah, okay. One in the back. First of all, awesome work. Um, <laughs> did you apply your fitness function to, for instance, Bog's own 
Kunst der Vögel? <laughs> if so, would it come out of it? Uh, you, uh, no, it wouldn't fit. The, the fitness functions are very specific to species counterpoint, which is an academic exercise. Um, Bach, well, you learn from Bach. Um, it's sort of like almost here to suggest that you might measure it. <laughs> really. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, three voice uh, first species uh, counterpoint be easier to do than uh, fifth species uh, two voice. I think. Um, I don't know, um, is the honest answer. The feeling I get is that, yes, it will be easier because the rules are, are more constrained and, and simpler to apply, um, whereas fifth species counterpoint is, is pretty kind of wild stuff. Um, so I think, yeah, three-part first species counterpoint is going to be easier than two-part fifth species counterpoint. So we have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, did you maybe think about applying a uh, similar uh, exercise for uh, harmony rules like chord progressions? <laughs> uh, there aren't really um, rules for chord progressions. Well, there are, no, there are, but um, not in, say, for example, popular music. Um, it, there are rules, say, you want to move from one key to another. There are, uh, when I say rules, I'm meaning heuristics here. Um, there are suggestions as to how you would do this modulation. You do a cadence into the new key, which is usually moving from a fifth to a five, five one, basically. Um, but of course, and this is the thing about music, is that we might have all these rules, but uh, composers and musicians, they, they've internalized these rules, but they know when it's appropriate to break the rule uh, and, and push the boundaries and things, and that's, that's where great music happens. Couldn't encode that, I don't think, using a genetic algorithm. So. Okay, um, um, my second question: um, uh, What can you do with uh, suboptimal uh, uh, genomes? For example, um, because uh, I believe that there will be a few of them that will have a high scores. So, for example, m maybe you could um, uh, distinct them uh, by uh, mood or gender, or maybe there's some some, some way for uh, cho choosing one or other, not only the top one. Yeah. Okay, so this is where it's going to get a little bit confusing because one of the techniques that you can use with genetic algorithms is to split your solutions into species. Um, and what you do is you then uh, breed within the species. So these are solutions that are similar to each other, which means that um, you might have a species that has a particularly good, unique um, solution um, or aspect to it, uh, but you don't want it to evolve out of the bigger generation too quickly. So by allowing a species to sort of continue from one generation to the next, um, you're, you're in some way promoting that, that little uniqueness, um, not related to species counterpoint. Oh, there's my screensaver. <laughs> yeah, it's the fortune cookies. <laughs> okay, should we call it a day? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, say thank you, Nicholas. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> cool.